talk about McDonald's. Wake up and bagelize. Get your taste buds ready for McDonald's breakfast bagel sandwiches. Now just $3 only on the app. Choose from a delicious steak, egg, and cheese bagel, bacon, egg, and cheese bagel, or sausage, egg, and cheese bagel. Just $3 when you order ahead on the app. Hurry and seize this breakfast steal before it's gone. Offer valid 7-17-2023 through 8-13-2023 at participating McDonald's. Valid one time per day or per person or any other limitation. Must opt into rewards. When it comes to sleep, overheating is a nightmare. One way to stay cool, the all-new Tempur-Pedic Breeze Collection, available at Ashley. The Tempur Breeze Collection is the ultimate solution for hot sleepers, pairing all new cooling technology that pulls heat away from the body with the comfort you expect from Tempur Pedic. So it's cool from the second you lie down all throughout the night. Head to your local Ashley store to talk to a sleep expert and shop the Tempur Pedic Breeze Collection today. One of those inconsistencies was about how worried Francisco was and when. Like Francisco tells them that he was worried right away, basically from the 15th on. Says he even tried to search for them on his own, which I'm pretty sure is news to Lydia. And then Allison's best friend comes forward and tells investigators that he'd stop by their apartment looking for Allison on either the 16th or 17th. So again, after he says he's worried and looking for them, and when this friend stops by, Francisco had told him not to worry because they're in Toulouse, they turned off their phones, everything's probably fine. So he's all worried and searching on the 15th, but he's telling this kid the very next day or so that nothing's wrong and he knows exactly yeah. where they are. Yeah, and obviously both can't be true. Right. And at the same time, investigators are figuring out some other concerning things. Like, not only have neither of the women used their phone since the 14th, and there's no sign of them on the internet or social media, but they also haven't touched their bank accounts. Is there traveling without spending a single dollar? It doesn't add up, right? And the whole idea of them traveling actually doesn't make much sense either because the family car is with Francisco, and neither woman have licenses anyway. When investigators check the CCTV footage at the train station, they're not on it. There isn't any record of them taking any form of public transportation to Toulouse or anywhere. Ashley, what are you talking about? It all makes sense. Of course they haven't spent any money traveling. These two must have freaking walked to Toulouse. I mean, honestly, it's the only option that makes Francisco's story make sense. Nothing is adding up. And at the end of July, investigators put out a national broadcast asking the public for help finding the women. And right away, a few tips do filter in. Possible sightings of both of them, I think. But investigators' initial hopes are dashed when they turn out to be false leads. So on August 1st, they finally turn their attention to the family apartment for a search. Forensic techs home through the place for like five hours. Wait, 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 wait. I've, I've been stuck on this. It took till August 1st to look at the apartment? Yes. So they go missing on the 15th, we think, and Francisco is just being in the apartment, hanging out, being worried, then suddenly not being worried, and being worried again for over two weeks before investigators even take a look at the place? Yeah, you're not. Yes, there is this huge gap where they're not taking a look around at all. And I know it sounds suspicious or it sounds like time was lost, but I don't know if it mattered that they waited because as far as like evidence of a crime scene goes, when they do this like five hour long search two weeks later, they don't find any evidence of foul play. Okay, but to me, that's all the more reason it does matter. I mean, saying nothing's there now, again, 18 freaking days later, does not mean there was always nothing there. Yeah, and you're right. And listen, what they're saying isn't that. They're not saying all all's good here, nothing happened here. Okay. Really what they're saying is that they haven't ruled anything in or out or anyone in or out. I mean, they're still open to the possibility of a voluntary disappearance, but they are still considering some form of foul play. By August 4th, Francisco seems like he is just crumbling which becomes super clear when a video of him is posted online that day. And just an FYI, I'm a little unclear whether Francisco himself posted this video or whether it was shared with the media outlet that then posted it, but 
either way, in it, he's speaking directly to the camera, openly weeping. And I'm actually going to play a little bit of the clip for all of you. And obviously, most of us won't be able to understand the words he's saying. But I want you, it's more the emotion I want you to get because he is clearly distressed. And in the video, he is like declaring his unconditional love for his daughter and says that he's hoping for the safe return of both his daughter and his wife. And he also refers to all of the pressure that he's under, saying that despite his best efforts to hold on, he's on the verge of exploding. <laughs> of it being like on the verge of exploding, trying to hold himself together. Saying how much he loves his daughter. Yeah. yeah. It's heavy stuff. And it also introduces some troubling questions. Like, yeah, it seemed like he was being sincere in his video. And mm -hmm. I, I do. I think he was being sincere. But the question becomes, sincere about what? Sincerely devastated right. about the disappearance of his wife and daughter or sincerely guilt-stricken by the knowledge of how they disappeared? And this is really when investigators change their tune publicly. Whatever discretion they've been exercising up to this point regarding their suspicions of Francisco, it's pretty quickly set aside. At a press conference that same day, the deputy prosecutor acknowledges that the women probably aren't alive. And he indicates that the chances of any sort of voluntary disappearance on their part are rapidly diminishing. And he goes even further acknowledging that it's, quote, difficult to accuse a dead person. But he's also doing little to hide the fact that that's what he's doing. Right. Now that Francisco's gone, basically their only real possible witness to the women's disappearances, investigators decide to seize Francisco's cell phone and laptop, as well as to take another look at the family's apartment. Mm -hmm. While those items are being analyzed, they also establish a national tip line because they're having a really hard time finding witnesses who can either confirm or dispute elements of Francisco's story. And I think that's in part just due to the time of year it is, because July and August are the months that a lot of French people go on extended vacation. So a lot of people who live in this area are out of town while all of this is going down. I gotta say, Europeans are on something with the whole month-long vacation thing. Listen, I want to want that so badly and you know this but I'm quite literally allergic to vacation so <laughs> true I might actually be like taken out by the plague if I was to go out that long yeah that'd be dangerous for you agree anyway even with France being in its peak season at this point investigators eventually track down some neighbors of the family who confirm overhearing frequent arguments coming from their apartment which we kind of already knew right I mean we know they were separated Francisco even said that they left after an argument that they'd had. Right, that's true. This really isn't new information, although it does tend to support the conclusions that investigators are already reaching. And the next tip that they get makes them certain that they're on the right track, because it turns out this isn't the first time a woman closely associated with Francisco has disappeared under highly suspicious circumstances. They get this tip from a man named Claude, but really, Claude is calling on behalf of his four teenage kids, who he had had with a woman named Simone de Oliveira Alves. Because when Francisco's face flashed across their television, Claude and Simone's kids couldn't believe what they were seeing. Or rather, they couldn't believe who they were seeing. You see, back in 2004, nearly a decade, nearly a decade before Allison and Marie José went missing, 40-something-year-old Francisco had been stationed in the French city of Nîmes. And although he was 
very much married at the time and a father to Allison, who was around 10 years old, he insisted to Simone, this 28-year-old Brazilian mother of four, that he was single and childless. And having no reason to disbelieve him, Simone and Francisco began this passionate affair and things got kind of serious. I mean, serious enough that she introduced him to her kids. And based on what they tell investigators, he hadn't just met them. He practically acted as a stepfather to them for months, right up until the day their mother vanished without a trace. According to Simone's sister, it was when Simone found out about his whole other family that she disappeared. And not just that. Again, according to this sister, Simone might have even been pregnant. And it's not like no one noticed when she went missing back then. I mean, she had four kids. So authorities opened an investigation into her disappearance, but it doesn't seem like it got very far before it went cold. All investigators were really able to determine was that Simone and Francisco had gotten into some kind of argument. And on the evening of November 29th, 2004, she had texted him to say that she was leaving and she wasn't coming back. And then poof, she was gone. So uh, this guy didn't even come up with a new story? Uh, she texted him? I mean, it worked pretty well the first time because the investigators got nowhere. Either they thought she really left or maybe they had suspicions that they couldn't prove. I don't know. Basically, a couple of years after her disappearance, her case had pretty much been abandoned. No one was digging into it. But now, in 2013, another woman connected to Francisco has sent this vague text that she's leaving and basically has fallen off the face of the earth. Then he takes his own life, just as police are starting to, like, squeeze on him. So, yeah, maybe it's time to reopen that 2004 case. And they do. Now, it's also around this time that they get results back from Francisco's electronics. And right away, they're pretty interested in a call he made just prior to ending his life. It was to a woman in Spain named Maria Teresa. Is this the woman he was seeing before? The one that Allison had found communications with? Yes, same woman. Literally was about to follow up on that. Like, I was wondering if they ever tracked her down and talked to her to see if she knew anything. I get the impression they didn't know anything about her before they found the records of this call. Which is kind of weird. Like, again, I don't know if they're not talking to Lydia. It's a little muddy and, again, might be getting lost in the translation as well. But either way, they know about her now. They track her down. And she tells them that not long after the two women had, quote unquote, left, she had a romantic rendezvous with Francisco at the family apartment. Um, how long is not long? Less than a week? I mean, I think she was there on July 19th. Jesus Christ, we keep it classy, Francisco. Yeah. If I remember correctly, that was before they were even reported missing, right? Right. And that is an important point, because as far as I can tell, Maria Teresa had no reason to think anything was amiss when she was there. But there was something that she didn't fully appreciate at the time, that now she's thinking might be important. She tells investigators that she had noticed something disturbing. You see, when she was there, the apartment had this terrible smell. Time for a quick break to talk about McDonald's. Wake up and bake a lot. Get your taste buds ready for McDonald's breakfast bagel sandwiches, now just $3, only on the app. Choose from a delicious steak, egg, and cheese bagel, bacon, egg, and cheese bagel, or sausage, egg, and cheese bagel. Just $3 when you order ahead on the app. Hurry and seize this breakfast steal before it's gone. Offer valid 7-17-2023 through 8-13-2023 at participating McDonald's. Valid one time per day or per person or any other limitation. Must opt into rewards. When it comes to sleep, overheating is a nightmare. One way to stay cool, the all-new Tempur-Pedic Breeze Collection, available at Ashley. The Temper Breeze Collection is the ultimate solution for hot sleepers, pairing all-new cooling technology that pulls heat away from the body with the comfort you expect from Tempur-Pedic. So it's cool from the second you lie down all throughout the night. Head to your local Ashley store to talk to a sleep expert and shop the Tempur-Pedic Breeze Collection today. Without the necessary context, she didn't really question Francisco when he told her that the smell was nothing to worry about. Just the smell of the neighbor's garbage wafting in through the bathroom window. The closed 
bathroom window. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, it's totally that. Right. So hearing all of this, investigators are thinking that the smell wasn't trash. Duh. And the woman's bodies aren't in the apartment by now. I mean, they know that. They look through the apartment. But could they have been on July 19th or in the days leading up to it? Which we would have known if they didn't take nearly 20 days to even look at the apartment. Well, again, I mean, they were reported missing, like, at, even at that 19th time. So no one would have known to even go there on an official basis. But you do wonder. I mean, like, if the smell lingered, if there was something to be found on day 11 when he was dragged to report them missing, maybe they were still there. Maybe there was something to find then rather than wait until day 18 or whatever. I don't know. And was Lydia ever in the house during this time? Did she smell anything or think anything was off? This is so frustrating, but I don't know. I can only assume yes, since we know she was in town on the 25th to go to the police department with Francisco. But I can't say for sure. So if she saw or smelled anything off in the apartment, I don't know. Now, around this time, investigators expand their search efforts from the family home to include the facilities Francisco had access to while working with a French foreign agent. Because it's not like he just had your run-of-the-mill office job. He had access to living quarters and stuff. And when they start poking around in those areas and interviewing colleagues from the barracks, they realize that he had been doing some bizarre things in the days after his wife and daughter disappeared. Like, for one, they track down a witness who says that he helped Francisco transport a freezer from the family's home to the barracks on July 17th. Seemingly out of nowhere, Francisco had decided he wanted to donate this freezer to the French Foreign Legion. You know, as one suddenly wants to do when one's family is missing. Mm -hmm. So he had this colleague come to the family's apartment to help him move this thing. And, and did this guy notice a smell in the apartment? Well, actually, that's a great question, but something that, again, the source material doesn't say anything about. But what they do mention is something else that he noticed. He noticed while he was there that a sink was clogged with this thick red liquid. And did he ask why? I don't think so. But keep in mind, this is all happening before the women were reported missing. So he just made a mental note of it, probably not even super consciously, and then went about helping Francisco move this free... This station, and from your part-time controller, specializing in nonprofit accounting. Your part-time controller helps nonprofit organizations, including associations, with their accounting needs. More at yourparttimecontroller.com. And from UMA, a cloud-based phone service for any size business with an automated virtual receptionist, video meetings, and other features to connect to customers and coworkers anywhere at uma.com slash NPR. This is NPR. It's all things considered from NPR News. I'm Mary Louise Kelly. And I'm Juana Sanders. Insurance is a critical part of home ownership in the U.S. It is a requirement for most mortgages, and it offers protection against disasters like hurricanes and fires. But as NPR's Nathan Rott reports, home insurance is becoming harder to afford and to get as the world warms. The wildfires were burning more frequently near her home outside of Yosemite National Park, so Beth Pratt did what a homeowner in a wildfire prone area is supposed to do. She put a metal roof on her home, replaced wood decks with laminate, installed a water tank and fire hose. I've remortgaged my house, you know, spent my life savings doing everything right. And it didn't matter to her insurance company. I just got a letter, not even a hey, we want these things done. It was, we're not renewing you. Allstate, Pratt's insurer of 31 years, had deemed wildfire risks in her area too great. For Pratt, the problem wasn't just that she wanted insurance to cover any losses in the event of a wildfire. It's that if you're someone like me as a mortgage, you would be in default of your loan if you don't have insurance. Pratt's story is becoming more and more common. Earlier this year, major insurers Allstate and State Farm, both of which declined to comment for this story, announced that they would no longer write new home policies in California, in part because of growing wildfire risks. Existing policies in some cases are not being renewed. In California and elsewhere in the United States, we're 
were marching steadily towards an uninsurable future. Dave Jones is a law professor at the University of California, Berkeley. He was the state's insurance commissioner until 2019. We're simply not doing enough fast enough to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And as a result, climate change continues to accelerate. Major insurers throw for their models what climate scientists have been warning for decades. That climate change is fueling more intense and in some cases more frequent wildfires, floods, and storms. More extreme weather disasters means more damaged or destroyed homes, which means bigger losses for insurance companies and higher rates for millions of homeowners. George Hosko is with LexisNexis Risk Solutions, a data provider for insurers. I have fuel gradual in everybody, but you're seeing a, a gradual increase in rates to catch up with the increases in costs. The cost of home insurance has risen 21% nationally since 2015, Hosfield says. Hotspots like Colorado and Texas have seen increases of 40%. Florida, 60 We're going through a hard time. Michael Yaworski is Florida's insurance commissioner. Since I started this job, I get about 50% congratulations and 50% condolences when I run into someone who's asking why I'm here. Just this month, two major insurance companies announced they're pulling back from Florida. In the last two years, more than half a dozen of the state's smaller insurance companies have gone bankrupt as back-to-back -back hurricanes caused billions of dollars in losses. Increasingly, people are ending up on state-backed programs, generally called insurance of last resort. Think of it like a safety net for people who need insurance but can't get it from the private marketplace. People like Beth Pratt. It does not cover as much as private insurance. And uh, I did get a quote, I will be going on it. It's double what I was paying. Some of her friends, she says, have seen their rates quadruple on the state-backed plan. These are not luxury items for myself or others. You have to have insurance. So, you know, I think that policies and, and how we insure people probably has to change. Especially, she says, as climate risks continue to grow. Nathan Rott, NPR News. Twitter is now X. Elon Musk has ditched the company's famous Bluebird for an X logo. Musk says it's part of a radical change he hopes to make, turning Twitter from a social media platform into an everything app. We are joined by NPR tech reporter Bobby Allen. Hey, Bobby. Hey, Mary Louise. I can't keep up. Um, Twitter, it, it's a globally recognized brand. Why change the name? Well, ever since Musk took over Twitter, he's been talking about this moonshot goal, right? Expanding Twitter to become the everything app, as you mentioned. So that would include banking services, online shopping, ordering an Uber, and so on. For the app to become an all-in-one app, right? In China, this sort of super app exists. It's called WeChat, and Musk says the U.S. ought to have one. Musk is now projecting an X on Twitter's San Francisco headquarters. He's Replace the company's Bluebird with an X on the app. He's really trying to push this new X identity. But what's really notable, Mary Louise, is he's doing this while not offering any new services. I talked to Joshua White about this. He's a finance professor at Vanderbilt University. And White told me that the name change looks like a desperate attention grab. And he says, you know, changing the name of a company after 17 years without offering anything new, it, it just doesn't make much business sense. Sort of like buying Coca-Cola and ditching the iconic bottle, but not changing the formula. Okay, and the name X, why X? Musk has long been enamored with X. Back in the late 90s, he founded an online company called X.com that later merged with another firm and became PayPal. Musk's other company, Tesla, has a popular vehicle called the Model X. One of his children has a name that is shortened to X. And well before launching this rebrand, Musk changed the parent company of Twitter to X Holdings. He wrote yesterday on Twitter that he likes the letter X, which seems pretty clear, doesn't it? Um, so why X? Why is Elon obsessed with X? That's a question I don't have an an the answer to. Um, you know, some historians of Elon Musk say it's probably sentimental. As I mentioned, his wealth has roots in his early company, X.com. So, you know, maybe it's some kind of nostalgic nod to that. Well, maybe you could tweet at him and ask him or whatever we're calling it now. You could X at him. It's All Things Considered. From NPR News, I'm Laura Summers. And I'm Mary Louise Kelly. Director Christopher Nolan made Oppenheimer to be seen on the big screen. And seen on an IMAX screen, Oppenheimer is an immersive epic. If you see for the first time 
an IMAX pure contact print from a negative project on the screen. It's like somebody is slapping you in the face. Fresh news. Live from NPR News in Culver City, California, I'm Dwayne Brown. President Biden is set to sign a proclamation establishing a national monument to Emmett Till and his mother. A black teenager from Chicago was tortured and killed 68 years ago after being accused of whistling at a white woman in Mississippi. Till's lynching and his mother's insistence on an open casket helped galvanize the early civil rights movement. White House press secretary, John Hill. for the civil rights movement. How, 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 uh, how else can, there are many ways we can lift up um, his memory, but this is an important way to do that. The White House says it's working to protect the places that tell a more complete story of U.S. history, while at the same time arguing that, quote, Florida's new educational guidelines are seeking to erase parts of black history. American Airlines pilots were supposed to vote on a new four-year contract agreement today, but as Becca Moore of member station KERA tells us, they postponed voting indefinitely to consider a new deal. The original agreement offered American pilots a 42% pay raise, but the union that represents them said that fell short of a recent pay increase offered by United Airlines. The new offer from American now matches those increases. Pilots also would get a ratification bonus, more sick time off, increased life insurance, and a medical privacy clause. The new deal is expensive for American and possibly customers. It would add a billion dollars in costs for the Fort Worth-based carrier over four years and could lead to higher airfares. No word yet on when American pilots will begin voting on the new agreement. I'm Becca Moore in Dallas. Well, stocks finished higher on Wall Street as the tech sector begins its earnings reports this week. The Fed is also meeting to discuss inflation and whether to raise interest rates again. The Dow gained 183 points, up half a percent. This is NPR. Good afternoon. I'm Ann Thompson. This is 91.7 WVXU. Kentucky lawmakers are working to give the formerly incarcerated a clean slate faster. As Lisa Autry of member station WKYU reports, legislation will be filed again in the 2024 General Assembly that would make the expungement process automatic. Kentuckians with low-level, non-violent convictions can already have their criminal records erased, but most say it's too difficult and costly. Representative Kim Mosier says she plans to refile a bill that would allow criminal records to automatically be expunged as long as offenders stay crime-free for five years and pay restitution in full. During a meeting of the Interim Judiciary Committee last week, State Senator John Schickel said he didn't support the bill last session and won't this time. Who are we to say that small businesses or someone that wants to do a background check that uh, the government can hide that from us? According to data presented last week to state lawmakers, 38% of Kentuckians have a criminal record but fewer than 10% eligible for expungement go through the complex process because in many cases, they can't afford an attorney. I'm Lisa Autry in Bowling Green. Indiana's permitless carry law went into effect in July of last year. Several listeners were curious about how this may affect Hoosiers. John Macy is an associate professor at the IU Bloomington School of Public Health. He says from a public health standpoint, removing protections such as background checks and firearm safety training will likely increase the possibility of gun violence. If we're interested in protecting people from unnecessary injury and death, that weakening these kinds of laws is not the right approach. Pierre Atlas is a senior lecturer at the Paul H. O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs at IUPUI. He says the former Indiana licensing process to obtain a permit was much more helpful in combating gun violence. If you go through the licensing process, you are already thinking more critically about carrying a firearm than if you know that you don't have to do anything and you can just go ahead and get it. Some nationwide studies suggest a lack of licensing may increase violence. A 2022 study from Johns Hopkins shows a more than 9% increase in assault with firearms that expected over 10 years as 34 states relax restrictions on carrying firearms in public. Showers and storms fading tonight, partly cloudy and muggy, a low 67. Tomorrow's high 90, it's 82 now. I'm Ann Thompson, this is 91.7 WBXU. Support for NPR comes from this station. I'm from Britbox with the new season of Silent Witness. Every dead body tells a story in this long-running forensic crime drama starring Amelia Fox. New season streaming at Britbox.com slash NPR. And from Indeed, 
designed to be an end-to-end -end hiring solution for businesses of any size to attract, interview, and hire candidates all from one place. More at indeed.com slash NPR. This is NPR. From NPR News, this is All Things Considered. I'm Juana Summers. And I'm Mary Louise Kelly. Let's go to Israel now, where violent protests have erupted in response to a new law just passed today that limits the powers of that country's Supreme Court. Protesters say the new law gives Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu too much power, that Israel's very democracy is at stake. Well, the idea of democracy under threat is, of course, too familiar here in the U.S. To get a sense of what's the same and what is different and what this new Israeli law may tell us about the state of democracy there, I am joined now by political analyst Dahlia Schindlin from just outside Jerusalem. And Dahlia, I know you're normally based in Tel Aviv. As I say right now, you're in a village near Jerusalem. What does it feel like there today? Well, I think I feel here like people do everywhere in the country, which is very, very concerned. I would say even nervous. Now, everybody it is a big word. Let's go by the election results. About half of Israelis who did not vote for this government, plus from all polling we know, a certain slice of people who did vote for the government are deeply opposed to the legislation that was passed today, which essentially removes one of the tools that the Supreme Court has used to place constraints or to reject government decisions mm -hmm. on occasion. Now, this is what we call the reasonability basis. It's a legal reasoning that the right-wing parties that currently hold the government have been trying to get rid of for a long time because they don't want any constraints on the executive. So just practically speaking, I'm trying to understand this. This is if the government does something that the Supreme Court thinks is unreasonable, the court used to be able to block it, and as of today, with this new law, they won't be able to? Is that the gist? Yeah, that's the gist of it. And another one of the chief concerns is that the government could hire inappropriate people in the government who essentially corrode the idea of accountable and responsible government and can fire people at will if they don't conform to the government's perspective on everything. Now, some people might say that that's called being allowed to govern. Well, there is no such thing in a democracy as governing without checks and balances on state power. Stay, stay with that point. Checks and balances, separation of powers, because when we're taking on this question of whether this new law threatens democracy, democracy looks and operates quite differently in Israel than how we understand it here in the U.S. It does, and I think that this is something that I think has been misleading over the years, in the sense that the rest of the world has often looked to Israel as essentially a model democracy on some level, and I think that it is worth realizing that Israel can't be compared to Western democracies that are most of the time at peace. Israel has essentially always been either at war or involved in a protracted military occupation, which is anti-democratic by nature. But the second major issue is that Israel has declined to build some of the key institutional pillars of democracy from the start. There is no constitution, for example. There is no constitution, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. We have no real separation between the legislature and the executive powers because it's a parliamentary system. We only have a single chamber of our parliament, unlike nearly all other democracies. No president can veto our presidential ceremonial, and we're not part of international courts. We don't even have term limits on the prime minister because it's a party system. And then going directly to the courts, because that's what this new law deals with. You know, here in the U.S., there are, of course, all kinds of questions about perceived yes. politicization of the Supreme Court. How about in Israel? Well, that, that accusation has been around for a long time. And I think that from the moment the Israeli right wing took a populist turn, and when I say populist, I mean ultra-nationalist and certainly targeting uh, citizens, such as, you know, critics of the government, civil society, the Palestinian art. and certainly targeting uh, citizens, such as you know, critics of the government, civil society, the Arab Palestinian minority in Israel, left-wingers. And this goes back about a decade. When that happened, then people began challenging these policies and bills and legislation in the Supreme Court. And thus began the theme, a very, very consistent, almost unrelenting theme that the court has imposed an unwanted universalist liberal perspective on the country. 
So square this with the argument that the conservative right in Israel would make. That they are saying that they are saying this new law will. will I can't square that for you. What it does is remove one of the few constraints that exist on the power of the executive. I just I, the only way I can explain it to you is what the government means. What they mean is that once there are elections, nothing should constrain what the government does with the mandate that it's been given by the people because the majority rules. Now, you cannot redefine democracy to be a stripped-down form of elections alone. The idea of majority rules has never been the meaning of democracy. It's always been a matter of protecting of, of representative government and protection of the individual. You can't do that without checks and balances on power. You can't do that without protecting institutionally the full range of civil rights. Without those, elections aren't meaningful anyway. Dahlia Shindlin is a policy fellow at the think tank Century International, also a columnist for Haaretz. She joined us from near Jerusalem. Thank you. Thank you so much. So-called forever chemicals could be in nearly half of the country's drinking water, according to a recent study by the U.S. Geological Survey. They are called PFAS, and this year, the Environmental Protection Agency proposed to limit PFAS chemicals in drinking water. In Virginia, state officials want to know if a type of PFAS known as Gen X is found in fish. Roxy Todd of member station Radio IQ in Roanoke waded through the local river for this report. The water is beautifully clear, with thousands of snails clinging to rocks. We're at the uh, South Fork Roanoke River, just above Alistair. Jason Hill is one of four researchers out on the river today. We're all wearing brown waders, knee deep in the water. Across the street is the source of a chemical leak that lasted at least two years, says Sarah Baumgartner with the Western Virginia Water Authority. And we found it, and it was rather surprising. What surprised her is that this part of the river was pristine, until a company, ProChem, added a PFAS, a forever compound known as Gen X. So Roanoke's drinking water no longer comes from here, she says. We stopped pulling water out of the Roanoke River, and we've just been using the water that we already had stored in our reservoir. That will last about three years, she says, and they hope that the Gen X will dilute or wash away, but it can stick to the rocks and sediment around us, and people still fish in this river. A recent study found that eating freshwater fish can potentially expose someone to PFAS. So biologist Kelly Hazelgrove dips a net into the water. Yeah. Woo -hoo! Find another one? Somebody ran over here. All right, oh, Mac. Get him. Get him, Mac. Matt Calvert is a biology major at Roanoke College, helping with the research. Today, he's wearing an enormous backpack that sends electricity into the water to shock fish. That makes it easier to catch them. That was a nice one that just ran by us. Calvert looks kind of like a ghostbuster moving through the water. There's a beep every time he shocks the water. They catch their first fish of the day. It has gold and brown speckles on its body. A rock bass. This bass and the other fish they catch will be sent to a lab in Richmond to be analyzed for 40 different types of PFAS compounds, including Gen X. State officials have not yet issued a health advisory for this part of the river. They're still reviewing the data, which will include the results from today's catch. For NPR News, I'm Roxy Todd in the South Fork of the Roanoke River. You're listening to All Things Considered. This is 91.7 WDXU. Experts say food companies are getting back to pre-COVID levels and developing new products. They had to pause because of supply chain issues. Some of the food scientists in their labs are among the first to graduate from a new Cincinnati State program. WDXU reports and focus on technology. The Culinary and Food Science Lab at Cincinnati State is quiet now because classes in the new Bachelor of Applied Science program don't resume again until the fall. Program Chair Grace Yak shows off the stoves, the sinks, and the counters. This is what you would see in a normal commercial kitchen. Then we have this side of the room, which is where we get a little bit more sciencey. Sciencey, because this degree is in culinary and food science for future food developers, flavor specialists, and more. Students can put their cooking, math, science, and engineering skills to use all together with beakers, flasks, a high precision scale, a magnetic stir, and immersion blender. 
Nicole Hatfield was among the first to graduate with this new Cincinnati State bachelor's degree. You hit the ground running day one. So you immediately make that jump from the kitchen to a lab setting. So we're starting off immediately making new products. We're doing gravies, we're doing salad dressings, we're doing, uh, we've done ice creams. And learning about technical ingredients, like the tiny print on the back of products. Flour salt is on the shelf in this lab. It's used in seasoning blends. Nearby are buffers to lower the pH. In product development, it's all about formulation and the ability to repeat the recipe exactly no matter who is making it. A lower pH in food prevents it from going bad, but it can cause a sour taste. That's where sodium acid sulfate comes in, another ingredient on the show. Here's back again. When you hear the word chemicals, that tends to alarm a lot of people, right? I mean, we need to better educate, you know, our consuming public that chemicals can be a whole lot of things. Salt is chemical, sodium chloride, you know, table sugar or sucrose. I mean, it can, you know, vinegar is acidic acid, and there are all kinds of different kinds of acid. She says consumers these days are much more discerning and talk about ultra-processed foods and food safety. Graduate Nicole Hatfield has always had an interest in science. She now has a full-time job as a culinary technologist at Sugar Creek, Groundworthy Food Solutions in Westchester. She works in a test kitchen and also on the manufacturing floor. I consider myself extremely lucky, so part of the program is you have to have uh, two semesters of a co-op of an internship within my first internship, which was with Sugar Creek. WVXU interview via Zoom because she was at her job as R&D coordinator for candy company Perfetti Van Mel. I've always had a soft spot for confectionaries. It's something I always wanted to do. Tafoya helps develop new flavors and new candy. She says she loves her job and says it's funny consumers think products just practically show up on the shelves, not thinking somebody has to develop them. Cincinnati State graduate Matt Schmidt used to be a butcher and likes to work with proteins. For his capstone project, he developed a Cincinnati style chili cheese sausage. Our seeds killing it, bangles are killing it, now the heads are killing it. So I was like, what if we get, what if we had a product that represented Cincinnati as a whole? And then it's probably the most famous food, which is Cincinnati style chili style and it there. So I basically re reverse engineered Skyline's recipe and then made it from there. Which is kind of Schmidt is interning at Sugar Creek, the same company fellow graduate Hatfield works for, and he would like to diversify his experiences in this wide field. As consumers learn more about food development and the ingredients in new products, Yek says the technology to make food is advancing too. For example, high pressure pasteurization prevents guacamole from turning brown. She hopes the technology becomes more accessible to more food producers and will resonate with consumers once they understand it. What's resonating with food developers this summer? Cozy Meal Magazine reports the trends include island flavors, spicy bakes, new colors and flavors of chocolate, and plant-based chicken. And talks and anyone else at WBXU. Support comes from the University of Cincinnati and the Windsor College of Business, offering their online Master's of Finance degree. 100% online from the same nationally recognized faculty as the on-campus programs. Financial aid available and the program comes with a dedicated student support specialist and academic advisor. More at online.pc.edu. This traffic report supported by Speedway, 71 southbound between Martin Luther King and Washington Way. You're slow. Also getting the brakes, 75 southbound between Hopple and Fort Washington Way. 74 eastbound at Cole Rain and that construction zone. There's a wreck in the cleanup stages. Support comes from Central Connection, a division of Central Clinic Behavioral Health. Central Connection is the front door for Hamilton County's behavioral health system. Services for mental health and substance use are now available by calling 513-558-8888. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. Showers and storms fade tonight, a low 67. Tomorrow, hot and more humid at a high of 90. 
from NPR News. This is All Things Considered. I'm Mary Louise Kelly. And I'm Juana Summers. More student, af more student athletes are filing lawsuits against Northwestern University. They are related to a growing number of complaints about hazing and abuse in the school's sports programs. Attorneys and a former student gave a more detailed account of what they say occurred and they charged the university failed to prevent hazing. Lisa Phillips of member station WBEZ has been watching what's happening and joins us now. Hi, Lisa. Hey there. So Lisa, Northwestern is already facing at least three other lawsuits. Another was filed today. Tell us what's different here. Yeah, this is the first lawsuit that has a named player and it also has new information about alleged hazing within the football team. It has claimed that members of the coaching staff were actually aware of hazing and even subjected to hazing. And details about the hazing have previously come out and includes a tradition known as running where a group of upperclassmen would hold down an individual so this might have been an underclassman or I guess even a, a member of a coaching staff while they're the whole party is nude and the upperclassmen would actually dry hump the younger players so some of these allegations you know were pretty graphic yeah. in detail um, um, ben Crump is one of the attorneys representing the former players. Here's what he had to say about it. It's a real big deal when these young people have the courage to take a stand and refuse to be victims anymore, refuse to have their voices silenced, but to take a stand. And Lisa, I understand that a former player came forward today, was named as a plaintiff named Lloyd Yates. Lloyd Yates used to be a Northwestern quarterback. What did he have to say? Yeah, Yates talked about how difficult it was to come.